Some think that biological women can be men and that biological men can be lesbians. Until a few years ago, these claims would have sounded quite odd, but today they're widely asserted and widely accepted in our institutions. Indeed, if you challenge them in a modern university, you can expect some sort of backlash. Journalists and others have had their say, but to properly scrutinize these ideas, you need a philosopher. So I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Kathleen Stock, a philosopher in the Western analytic tradition and the author of an important book, Material Girls, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. Uh, so Kathleen, welcome to Thanks. STB Talk. Um, so there's a lot in this, a lot to talk about. I want to talk about the job of philosophy first. Mm. Um, so brewers make beer, uh, bakers make bread. What do philosophers do? Um, they make mistakes. Mistakes, <laughs> and then talk about them. Or learn from their own mistakes. Um, philosophers make theories, but they're not scientific theories. They're not designed to um, predict or explain empirical evidence in mm. quite the same way as scientists make theories. Mm. Um, they're more theories about deep abstract issues for which there probably isn't any, certainly isn't any um, overwhelming empirical evidence one way or the other, mm. like what is meaning, what is truth. Uh, often in analytic tradition, they're, they're, they're questions about concepts, the limits of concepts, um, and how to define happiness or justice or art, um, or what a scientific law is. So um, it's quite difficult to explain to somebody who doesn't do it. And I think that the best way of learning is probably just reading some philosophy. Or, and then you've or sort of doing it. Or, or doing, or yeah, or trying to do it. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, it's certainly something, it asks questions that are of interest to many people, but not everybody has the capacity to answer them, I think. Mm. That's okay. Mm. I mean, it's a pretty narrow skill set. What I was looking for was really sort of looking at distinctions, because I think that's what mm. philosophers do, make distinctions between one thing and another, and yeah. types, and organise things uh, into categories. They definitely do a lot of that. Um, maybe the distinctions they make are not ones that ordinary language makes, and then they usually need an argument about why their distinctions are more important. Or sometimes they're just kind of looking at the way language works and saying, actually, this shows us that this isn't quite like that. I mean, it sounds banal, and especially when you, in your introduction, I mean, most people don't need philosophy to tell them that men can't be lesbians. It's pretty much well, it built into the now. concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it should, yeah. <laughs> but, we can go into you know, it. unfortunately, some, some philosophers have monkeyed about <laughs> mm. with uh, people's ideas there, and therefore another philosopher needs to come in and tell them that uh, don't believe the first lot. Yeah, really, pretty but, much. It, but it's what you aim you, in the analytic tradition. You're aiming at rigor, and you're trying to get your mm. uh, thoughts ordered, and you're trying to get things in the right place, aren't you? So, uh, classification. If, if we're going to do some work on this table, it's it's got four sides, uh, you know, and it's it's got four legs. It can be a member of the, of entities with four legs, like cats and dogs, but it's not a cat and dog. So you're yeah. you're, you're you're just making yeah. distinctions. Yeah, I mean those, those. Yes, a lot of this is going to sound like stating the bleeding obvious, mm. but the the question, um, the more the more sort of traditional philosophical question about table would be like, is there, you know, is this table uh, a real independently existing? object in the world or is it a product of a, of a mind yeah. um, in some way, like maybe it's secondary, what we call it secondary properties like the green cover. Um, in some sense that's that sense of station of green is produced in, in, um, uh, with cooperation from our nervous system and our optical systems and um, well, that's therefore good. there's some kind of mind dependent quality about it you know so there's a yeah. lot of stuff about the mind and the world and the interface between the two that's things. that's a good one to bring up actually because i am actually colorblind oh so, are you yes yeah, so that yeah so you're there you I go think it's, classic it's, example you know, so it is it, yes yeah, so it's john lock is it so he his primary qualities are the tables the yeah. tabletops uh, solidity. solidity or squareness or whatever it is mm. and that doesn't matter what you think it doesn't matter what i see it still is there that's that's it mm -hmm. and the greenness is perceiver dependent so yeah i that would be i Theoretically, can't see it. You can, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. Bat, you know, animals have different kind of um, perceptual systems. So. Mm. 
So it's about, yeah, so the important thing there is to, in terms of where we're going to go in this di discussion is that things to defend a realistic view, you know, uh, to defend truth, something has to correspond with facts. And uh, on your realistic view, it, it, can, it can exist independently of you. And it doesn't matter what you think. It does, certainly doesn't matter what your opinion is. Um, I don't know about what doesn't matter what you think. It certainly doesn't matter what an individual thinks. Yes, that's what I mean. Um, yeah. But, I mean, in order to get a sense of where I'm going in that book, you need a sense of the opposition, as it were. And in philosophy, you often need to, be, to know who your enemy is argumentatively mm. in order to give the thing some kind of drama. <laughs> so the opposition are people who think that everything, um, including the table and atoms and anything you can think of, um, is socially constructed by, through human intellectual behavior mm. and I'm saying well no, no. <laughs> there are you know there is, I don't I'm not I'm not naive about it obviously the mind contributes quite a lot to our understanding and our perception of the world as we've just demonstrated mm. um, but there are still things that exist before us and will exist after us that our minds are kind of latching on to um, and we either get those things right or sort of right or we get them very wrong but rightness and wrongness are determined part by the fit, partly between their thoughts, and in but some so, sense of fit, yeah, and so, the world. So, but so social constructivists, they do have some. I mean, some meaning uh, is is formed that way, isn't it? I mean, you know, the sort of tennis ball example. If you introduced a tennis ball to someone that didn't know anything about tennis, it wouldn't have very much meaning. But if to us it does have a sort of socially constructed thing, you, the, the tennis ball. Is a tennis ball, right? Well, not just yeah, I mean, I'm not denying yeah. the existence of, of social meaning in the sense of resonance, connotations, um, communicative uh, I ideas that can we can communicate about the things. But mm. social constructionism, as I just introduced it, is much, much more radical. Yeah. You yeah. know, we can't, there's nothing, there's nothing intelligible um, that's mind independent. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, mind independent. So. Mm. I mean, there's, there's more, there's some sophisticated articulations of that, and then there's some very unsophisticated articulations of that. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's all uninteresting or terrible, mm. but the way it comes into the sex and gender debate is suddenly people get very specific about womanhood <laughs> and they, and manhood to some extent, but more womanhood, you know, and they say that, and, and, it, and indeed being female or male, mm. there is no such thing as biological sex. Sex is just a social construction. Ignoring the fact that throughout the natural world, there's this, you know, enormously important division yeah. between the male uh, species, male uh, exemplars of a species and the yeah. female. It just seems, yeah, it's not even, it's not even a rebellious position that is, to me, it's um, just wrong. It's, just, it's, it's yeah. pretty, um, I find it odd because it, as I say in the book, fair enough, be a social constructionist if you want, but most social constructivists, um, are still sort of happy to acknowledge the reality of the things they think are socially constructed. But what's really peculiar about this move about femaleness and womanhood is that they not only say it's socially constructed, but they want to say it doesn't really exist. And that's... And they're going too far in there. And, and actually, as an intellect, there's a distinction, isn't there, between an intellectual exercise of being... It's like being an ultimate um, sceptic about everything, which philosophers do a lot. Mm. And, uh, you know, but then they're not sceptical about their their dinner later on no. at night, or, or as Ian Hacking said, no. who wrote one of the books on... Exactly. You know, he, you know, you're not... You still get on the aeroplane. You still get on the aeroplane because you're fairly yeah. certain it's going to be... Yeah. yeah. And it's not social, socially constructed, it's physics. I mean, yeah, so in that yeah. sense, these people who really, the diehard zealots who say sex is a spectrum or it's signed at birth or whatever they mean, mm. they're in really bad faith because they still know which people get pregnant. Yes. And they still might even take precautions, <laughs> you yeah, know, of course. to stop those people getting pregnant yeah. or want those people to get pregnant, you know. That, so. That's a little bit like, because in economics, uh, economists talk about, uh, st you know, stated, tr stated preference, don't they? And then mm. revealed preference, which is often different. Mm. And in politics, you get mm. this, you know, well, exactly. uh, middle class liberals profess liberalism and uh, their stated preference in terms of where they want to live is quite different. So they, we get the truth. We get the reality yeah, the truth through the behavior. Later if you're a behaviorist the... about belief, then you can yeah. say they don't really believe um, what they're saying. And in fact, you can see that in a different way because they always know which sex to pick on. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, that's right. Um, I want to get into some of the ideas in the book in a sec, but I just want to, before we finish on philosophy mm. itself, 
Um, how you, you appear to sort of be, you, you are the most prominent figure in philosophy making this point, mm. I think. Well, there's not that many of us. No, yeah, but so why? I mean, you know, because I, how well or badly is, is British philosophy done in this? Uh, a lot of people hiding that believe yes. what you think? Yes. Um, I think the thing is to try and be charitable to a lot of the British philosophers who stay away from this stuff. The philosophy involved in the enemy camp is so bad mm. that it would almost be beneath them to get involved with it at an abstract level. I mean, just getting their hands dirty. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, yeah. why would you, yeah. <laughs> unless the political context demanded it, why would you spend a book explaining to people that there's females and males and, you know, you can't change sex, we're not clownfish, you know, that sort of thing. I mean, it just seems a very uh, uninteresting work to the yeah. average philosopher. But there's also the fact that there's a very vocal small group of, um, they would call themselves feminist philosophers, um, who are big on social media and will immediately identify anyone who says the things I say as transphobic, and that's not very pleasant, and philosophers don't like conflict in that sense. So um, it's, it's and is partly there some a matter job, is, of... Is there some job protection here as well? I mean, you know, literally, if people... If, yeah, if, well, I mean, you know, they, look, they're unlikely to be made... It dep yes, at a junior level, there's definitely job protection because mm. I know I personally know quite a few young philosophers who think this is all absolute nonsense, but mm. are very nervous of engaging with it mm. publicly because they think that it means they won't get a job. And you know, there's hardly any jobs in philosophy anyway. Mm. Um, and once you do get in on the ladder, then you've got promotions coming up, and you've got colleagues that you want to get on with. Mm. And because this is such a hot button issue. And in, and in other departments, it can be, you know, the whole department could be rabidly trans activist, particularly mm. if you've got a gender studies department nearby. Mm. It just makes your life difficult, and most people don't want their lives to be difficult. Yeah, I can see that. I, I, it's, it's disappointing. I mean, there's one other sort of charge, a much broader one, which, which people have made, uh, which is that, you know, philosophy at any age just um, represents the going political view, the going social view. And, you know, so it's, it, there's no... On that account, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no real progress. I mean, there's no real uh, attempt to, to get at the truth in the inverted commas. You just it changes like the fashion in hats. Well, that's, I that's think very it's aggressive. true of some philosophers, and mm. particularly um, given the system which encourages you to, well, forces you to publish mm. every year, um, and you've got to always do something original. So you've got to look at sort of. Uh, logical space, as it were, or conceptual space, and say, okay, there's this bit here that nobody's argued for. Okay, right, I'll give this a go, but it's very close to this position, so it's sort of, you know, it's sort of in this safe ballpark. You're not off here, mm. you know, <laughs> so trying to bring down the whole edifice. Yeah. So you're tinkering around yeah. with existing views, and you can get an article out of it in a good journal. Well, that's a tick for your CV. I mean, it's yeah. very. It's not. We're not talking yeah. sitting around in the in the uh, agora. <laughs> yes, you know, yeah, we haven't, yeah. Anymore. Yeah. We're talking about being forced to publish. But a, there is actually, I mean, I mentioned before we kicked off that I'm keen on Epicurus, but the, there isn't anything new in a, in a sense in this. He get, I think Epicurus gave a, a speech at Colophon, uh, 3rd century BC, where he doubted the existence of gods, the gods. It was, I think some people were killed, was no, he nearly lost his life, he was very young, never did that again. Went off to Athens, formulated a different formulation, which was that the gods exist, but they don't do anything. They don't. So that's perfect. That's a perfect yeah. formulation. Anyway, they're not interested in us. So, yeah. but, so I, don't, I don't genuinely believe he believed that. Well, there's bits in David Hume where you can see that he's he's definitely trying to temper his atheism for the yes. audience. We see it all the time. Yeah. But what you see these days, I mean, maybe this is always thus, is people basically, especially in, I see it specifically in political philosophy and specifically in gender studies and feminist mm. Uh, mm. philosophy, they're basically taking the conclusion that Tumblr has produced or, mm. you know, or their students have produced, mm. um, i.e. trans women or women, for instance, taking that and as their starting point and going, okay, now what complicated metaphysical apparatus can I bring in to show this is true? Mm. But the, the, the impetus is just nakedly 
to get the right answer, the yeah. socially acceptable you answer see, that will get them some kudos. But in, it's not, yeah, so not just in this academic discipline, all academic dis disciplines, dredging, p hacking happens. Mm -hmm. People, you know, so yeah, you wonder yeah. how. It's a bit how disappointing. Good it, is. it is disappointing, but it is the world we live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. So <laughs> let's let's crack on and uh, and go into some of the claims of the book. So I mean, obviously, people are aware of this 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 sort of central uh, thing in 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 up for debate to some extent is, you know, what is a woman? What makes a woman? What is a clincher in that? Mm. Uh, you know, some people take a very economical view, which is basically mine, which is it's chromosomes. It's the easiest, most economical. Well, I should take an even more economical view, if not chromosomes. Yeah. Because, um, you know, there are males and females plants that don't have our chromosomes. It's, uh, it's being on a developmental pathway to produce large gametes or small yeah, gametes. But, well, you, yeah, in you, our you, case, you it's have chromosomes. Three, yeah, yeah, you could, you could. You, you, have, you, you outline them in the book three different approaches to that. But anyway, it is an ultra economical way. And mm -hmm. I, I, I realise you've got intersex people as well, but that's one way. And then the another way that, that is popular now is to say that it's all about gender identity, whatever that is. And I find it, for a start, I, I genuinely find it hard to get across the concept. Mm -hmm. um, many people wouldn't have, it wouldn't have occurred to them where they have a gender identity. Mm -hmm. So you, you set out the basic claims of tra trans ideology in the book, and you've got four. So the first one is that everyone has a gender identity. Uh, second one, sometimes gender identity doesn't match biological sex. Well, I would say that's probably true. I mean, isn't, it, isn't that true? Yeah, that is true. Yeah. That's if, but not the, not the first one. Not everyone has one. You obviously have to define what you mean by gender identity. But there are some people who don't feel, you know, strongly feel in some sense they're more identified with the opposite sex than their own sex. Mm. And that's the difficulty. So you, you, while you know biological sex is concrete and material, mm -hmm. and uh, gender identity is not, it, it's it's extremely difficult to define. And if you're going to have seventy different gender, it gets almost impossible. I don't. Well, that's the extra step that you know. Initially, the uh, the idea of gender identity took its context from biological sex. So you either had supposedly a gender identity which fitted with your own biological sex. Mm or you had one that fitted with the opposite sex, or maybe at the limit you had one which fitted with neither. Mm. Those, those were the options. So mm. you were a bit, you were ambiguous, you were sort of androgynous, say, or you felt androgynous, or you felt masculine, or you felt feminine. Mm. Um, then people started to add in extra gender identities, um, like being um, gender fluid, like one day you're this and the next day you're that, or agender, you don't have any gender, <laughs> which is in fact most people. So they sort of took the absence of a feeling of gender identity as a positive, Mm. attribute mm. Um, and from then on it just spirals based on, this is obviously no no science no scientist in a lab is coming up with this stuff it's basically popular culture Theory. just like yeah. memeing yeah, 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 stuff yeah. all over the place yeah, it comes from yeah. tumblr it comes from teenagers mucking yeah. about on the internet mm. But, um, but it does come from this I mean, very are, weird moment where people are taking that and putting it into university policies yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's 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 astonishing how how uh, you know I, it reinforces the view that uh, one of the most important words in the English language is no. Yes. And they don't, they, you know, institutions and other people seem to uh, be unable to do yeah, this. We don't have that. But it's still, I found it an extremely difficult concept. Mm. Uh, and it partly, as you say, the, the, on the biological side, it's, uh, it's, it's reasonably stable, isn't it? It's a stable. Well, it's definitely stability. stable. It's, so you, it doesn't change. Yeah. So, you, so that's there. And on the other side, it can fluctuate and it's very, very hard to define. And it's particularly hard to define without having recourse to quite old-fashioned stereotypes, right? Yes, yes, uh, because what it is to be, say, for me to be identified with the male sex is, is to sort of feel that I fit more with certain characteristics um, stereotypically, atta att um, stereotypically attributed to males. Mm. Um, they don't all have to be, like, sexist ones. I don't actually totally go along with the, the sort of Idea, critical idea you often hear that it's nothing but sort of pernicious social stereotypes. But it is true that when a man says he's a woman mm. and then often is asked why, he says, well, I've always liked lipstick. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. you know, I just feel at home in a, a floral frock. Yeah, um, it's like the Matt, Matt Walsh uh, film, wasn't it? I like scented candles, I watch Sex in the City. <laughs> I, I might be trans myself, you know. Um, and, and, you know, once you start thinking like that, you yeah. get, you, there's a backlash. So look at, you know, you can see yeah. that I dress mostly like a man and I'm six foot tall. And then there's lots of people on the internet saying, gosh, she's a failed woman. <laughs> you know, she yeah, I she think doesn't like scented candles or lipstick. But in, in a way, yeah, but the I think the problem is the cause in our thinking. And you talk about narrative a lot and, and obviously legal fictions in the book, but the, the, arguably the cause of certainly the expansion, massive expansion in this, 
It's just uh, a failure to grasp that the, there are so many different types of men and women. Yes. And include, there are types of men that have surgery to give themselves breasts. Mm. <laughs> you know, mm. there are types of men that cut their own get their mm. penises cut mm. off mm. and take hormones that give them uh, the appearance of female secondary sex characteristics. Mm. And there are men who don't do any of those things, but have um, a fetish that gives them an erection when they put on a dress. Mm. And, you know, we're not, there's been a big sort of taboo about saying those things. But there are many ways to be a man and there are many ways to be a woman, but you can't actually change. <laughs> you can't, stage. no, but it's, yeah, what I was getting at is that if we had a, if we were more liberal in our definitions the, uh, of, of, of femininity and masculinity, if we accepted the autonomy, yeah. and it's, although I you don't know, know they, that we, there's something we should, you know, we don't have to accept like extremely harmful no, uh, not, male not associated behavior or female associated behavior, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, but, we can be more relaxed about the ways in which you can be a man. Um, then arguably, especially for younger people who are feeling confused about this, they wouldn't mm. feel the pressure to put themselves yeah, in one box decide. or the other. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're, you're immediately prior to you getting in, involved with this, you were looking at uh, uh, legal fictions, weren't you? Sorry, uh, uh, fictions, generally. Fictions. Fiction, generally. Yes, yeah. so that was my specialty, yeah. So one, one, one I've, never, I've never read this, but I, uh, I, I'm always interested in metaphor, you know, because metaphor is... Um, is, is not literally true, but it does, in terms of meaning, it does heavier lifting quite often than literal mm. truth. Mm. So has anyone, has any trans theorist used that as an example of something that which does provide meaning? It's not literally true, but it's, but metaphor, we use metaphor all the time and it does massive uh, work um, on meaning. I mean, I I'm surprised know, they haven't, to I, be honest. Yeah. But the thing is that there's not one body of thought on this, even from the trans activist side. So, Although someone like Judith Butler comes in for some heavy criticism in my book, mm. I think it's fair to say that she would not, um, she thinks things should be more fluid. She, she, you know, she's someone who thinks there sh that gender should be more fluid. She thinks it should be so fluid that we should get, to get rid of the categories of men and women altogether because she thinks of those as constraining. But she, um, I don't think that she would, I don't know for sure, but this idea, you know, the very literal idea of, a man trapped in a woman's body. Mm. <laughs> I don't mm. think that's something that she would think was literally true. But the trouble is when you put all these ideas, these sort of highfalutin, um, mystical, almost quasi-mystical ideas into popular culture, people start to literalize them and concretize mm. them. And then they say, you know, I really am a woman. Well, that's, you know? yeah, so you get into compelled speech and it becomes, yeah. so you talk so about So maybe metaphor truth. would help. In the book, I talk about fiction. Just, we're, we're immersed in a fiction and it, we do that all the time. People, humans have the capacity to immerse themselves in fictions that are not literally true. Yeah. But it's, so, it's, so before yeah. we, we go on to some of the consequences of, of, of some of the trans theory, what would you say trans ideology gets right, if anything? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I, I, mean, I suppose my, the most generous, um, I do honestly find it like, difficult to find anything good about it because it's not as philosophically sophisticated and it also has all these terrible real world harms that its proponents are completely blind, blind to, to yeah. and they become yeah. very fanatical very quickly so mm. it, it's not a not a good sign of a theory that it turns its proponents into fanatics however yeah. um just to be try and be generous i do think um that the political attempt to push being non-binary, um, i.e. To, to say that you can be neither masculine nor feminine or neither particularly one or the other, or not, feel not particularly like a man, not particularly like a woman, is some kind of mis definitely misguided attempt to capture the sort of thing I actually think is true, which is, and that we've just been talking yeah, about, is, that we don't fit into boxes. Of course. That, there, that gender really is a spectrum. Yeah. And most of us are not at yeah. one pole or the other of it. Yeah, it doesn't, you, you're just as much a man or a woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's, that's what I, I think that's right, yeah. So moving on to the consequences, um, you, say, you, you obviously prefer in the book, a lot of, there's a lot of goodwill, um, I think we often politically and generally uh, underestimate goodwill everywhere actually there's a lot of goodwill around mm -hmm. and a lot of people will just argue that since there are uh, you know gender dysphoria exists uh, and we're a liberal society mm. um, why can't we just give uh, trans people a pass 
and if it makes them happy. Give them a pass. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's how, how Ben Copley would describe it on lots of lots of um, other areas of uh, you know of um, uh, radical activism. That people are happy and they'll agitate and 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 they 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 they're happy when you say okay, I'll give in. You can just have it. But, but, but can I just clarify? Like, what we're not even clear what giving them a pass means. Get, giving them what they want. Yeah. Well, I mean, even if we just. So that, that could be a range of things. That could be accept me as the woman I am, if it's a man. Mm. Or um, let me on the sports team, or let me in the bathroom, or let me in the, in the rape crisis shelter or the prison or whatever. Mm. Um, but even if we just forget about all the, the, I think, pretty obviously predictable real world harms that come in once you get into the spaces argument, if we mm. just take it about trans people, mm. it's not necessarily, and especially young trans-identified kids, mm. it's not necessarily good for them to give them what they want. <laughs> oh, totally, yeah, no, I agree. I'm, I'm actually just saying that the, I think one of the causes of, because uh, you could ask the question why any ideology washes over institutions to the extent it has, mm. and it has. So why has it happened? Right. I think it's goodwill. I think a lot, a lot of the time, goodwill, cow, you could say cowardice or whatever, but a lot of the time it's, well, you know, we want to be nice, so let's be nice. I think it's definitely goodwill, but we also, those people need to scrutinise why they feel this particular goodwill in this area, but not necessarily in other areas. To, or to other people. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why is this so easy for them to get on board with, but not, for instance, like um, really championing the cause of disabled people or really actually championing the cause of anti-racism? You know, it seems a lot easier for some people to, um, to well, we, posture we, about yeah. trans people and it is about any other group, and I think that they need to psychoanalyze themselves. <laughs> yeah, you make a, you make an interesting uh, plea for intersectionality at the end, which I slightly, <laughs> slightly agree with, you know, from the point of social class, because yeah, I think we're exactly. the only party that mentions it. Exactly, uh, we're working class people. Massively salient. It's just embarrassing. Yeah. People find all of those things too difficult, especially mm. middle class people, too difficult, you know, and, and maybe their own interests might end up getting pushed mm. against, but they see trans people's interests as so sort of exotic and discreet. Mm. Um, Plus, there's a real element, an unspoken element, I'm afraid, of pity, and not mm. in a good way. Mm. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not talking about me. I mm. respect trans people as mm. I take them as I find them. But, you know, there's a real kind of exoticizing mm. going on mm. of, oh, just give them what they want. Yeah, yeah, be and nice. It's patronizing as hell. It is, no, I've seen, but that, you see that in race as well. You see that well, all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, but one of the, I'm just going to run through very quickly some of the consequences as I sure. see them. So, so the consequences, first, Consequence is actually to truth itself, mm -hmm. because uh, yes, we sort of engage in a, a legal fiction, and by and large, people, I think, will accommodate that in most domains. Not all, but they, they will. But I think, say, when you get a situation, if you're if you're committed to truth and truthfulness, you are also committed to accuracy, accessibility, other, some other things, sincerity. Mm -hmm. um, when you read in a, a newspaper an account of a uh, an assault. And it, it might say, you know, um, it might describe a trans woman as a woman without saying trans at all. Yeah. And so that's a casualty. And I think people, you know, it's, it's, it's the her penis thing, you know. Mm -hmm. People, that's, I think the problem with that is in public discourse, in things like newspapers and what the BBC do, it's sort of, it's like a sort of um, debasement. And it, it also causes, I think, demoralization. Do you think that's fair? Completely fair. Um, I mean, it, it, it's a casualty to truth, but also the truth feeds into lot. Obviously, <laughs> it's the truth. Uh, lots of different discourses, civil discourses, policy discourses. Mm. I mean, you know, if you're going to start calling uh, rapists, male rapists, uh, women just because they tell you just before they're about to be convicted that they are, you you know, you're going to change the statistics on female rapists. And they, and, and they have, they've gone up massively in the last few years, you know, and it's not, I mean, it's not even possible well, who, under even... law for a woman to rape a man. She could be an accessory, but you have to have a penis in the first place. Yeah. So the whole thing's really, you know, if the law is supposed ideally to be clear, it's adding endless obfuscation. And um, if you care about getting accurate information about um, different behavioral patterns, between the sexes, which do exist, mm. then you're going to lose them. So, and, and it's a massive casualty there because, and a point that Alice Sullivan's made is that you can't actually do what what she does on quantitative social no. science cannot be done. No, it's just if you mess with, with the figures, it's, it's gone. I mean, the same issue 
uh, is uh, faces research on lesbians. I mean, there just is no robust hardly any robust data on lesbians anymore mm. Mm. because they're always being put into some other group for a start. It's not mm. even a, this has got nothing to do with trans activism. It's like lesbians and gay men are always put together as a group as if there aren't any interesting differences between the behaviors of lesbians and gay men. I mean, they clearly are. Or it's lesbians and bisexual women. And, and at the moment, the, the category of bisexual woman is going up like that because mm. it's a trend at the mm. moment. Mm. That for, so, you know, it's gone up tens of percents, mm. but most of those women won't sleep with women. So actually the category is just becoming well, expanded that, to the point of we're, meaninglessness. We're back, in, we're back into stated preferences and revealed yes, preferences. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, and it is tricky because obviously it's hard for researchers to get at people's real preferences about sexuality, particularly when lots of people confuse themselves about their own sexuality or don't want to say. Mm. But we don't need to make it harder than it already is by including males who say they're lesbians mm. in the group. Mm. I mean, that just makes the nonsense of it. So an another, I, no, I totally agree with that. I, I, another casualty, I think, is, is um, which obviously hit the news in Canada didn't it, a, few, a few years ago, uh, compelled speech. You mm. know? Now, again, goodwill, most people will, will want to be friendly and will agree with it, but it's, it's, when, it's when it's insisted on and if it's a, yeah. uh, a rights violation not to do so, uh, I have a problem with yeah. that. I agree. And the atmosphere in, in many institutions at the moment, and particularly universities, but not just universities, is it's impossible not, uh, it's almost impossible not to go along with um, what is being demanded of you because mm. the, it's it, it's in so many policy documents it's in websites it's it's reinforced by these um holy stonewall days mm. um there's just this massive manipulative attempt to get you to agree that the person in front of you that you know is not a woman mm. is a woman and that you must call her she and you must say woman and you mm. must watch what you say on a range of issues in case you offend them and some of these um, university policies have things like, um, you know, if a person tells you, you, you that they are a woman, you have to believe them. It's not even saying that's, that's, <laughs> a, that's a totally Soviet. I mean, that's Orwellian, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Full, full Orwellian now. I know. It's public truth. Right. It says something truth. like there's one in, I think it was the University of Leeds, that it says something yeah. like, think of the person as being the gender they tell you they are. Mm. So this is not even about what you say, it's Mind. like telling you how to think. Yeah, we're getting into mind control. Very worrying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So another, but a sort of more concrete thing, I guess, or a very concrete thing, is actually the rights that are accrued uh, by the legislation, which attaches to some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you're in just proper contestation, political contestation. I would say economics is, is about what you can make and politics is about what you get. Now, who, who gets what? And uh, the odd thing is that this is, uh, you know, a lot of interests, women's interests in particular, mm -hmm. have not, I don't think the people that originally set out on this journey really thought very carefully about, there's a trade-off, <laughs> you know, what is going to happen, what are the consequences? Fair. Yeah, yeah. And, and I actually know somebody uh, who was, vaguely who was at the founding of the Yogi Carter Principles and he says, no, oh, I didn't think about it at all. <laughs> no, it just, and then it just went mad. Oh, well, but then it has to, but then the clash with reality, the sort of reckoning, uh, does happen eventually and um, uh, you know it's like Scotland you know put a double rapist into a, a women's prison and then it just flips and people say no we're not having that but actually the, the, the probably the mainstream position was against that all along that's the difficulty. Yes but there is still I don't know I, I mean these these outrages that that particular outrage the Adam Bryson one um, so being a male rape is put in a women's prison and he's not the first I mean mm. well, that, can't, that can't was just be. the one the public noticed but there's actually lots of others well you make a point actually just on although absolute numbers are very much small you make a point I don't know what the, the exact percentage is but the number the uh, the number of uh, convicts that are trans women for instance mm. uh, that are, are locked up for sexual offenses, sexual offenses yeah. half isn't it about half well, it's high. I can't remember right now, but it's it's much higher Massively than the higher. male average. Yeah, yeah. Um, now that could be for a number of reasons. One is that you've obviously got an interest in identifying as a woman. Mm. There's a horrific story in the paper today. So mm. I was just thinking of this as yet, and you know, these these the, the women that are victims of this and the children. Their stories come out regularly now, but I don't know. There's still this inability for. Um, public bodies or government or policy, uh, policy makers to take all of them together and see <laughs> that this, the big thing the big thing that's yeah. going on but today it was mm. um, 
a woman very bravely who's who's identified herself as being abused by her father for years and images of her sold on by him mm. to other paedophiles mm. and he transitioned in prison um has come out as a woman and she now has you know the normal rights that she would have as a victim to know where he was mm. he, she doesn't have them anymore because mm. he's changed his identity mm. and, and then the state's now acting as if they need to protect him, him not her <laughs> not her yeah, not the victim, yeah. and it's obviously a cr completely insane um mind-blowing for your your paedophile father to be identifying as a woman yeah. in any case so the whole thing's absolutely disgusting but yeah. you know these cases are coming out cases like that or the women's sports where where women that have young women that have worked trained for years to get somewhere miss out because a man just saunters in age yeah, 45. Yeah, no I've, <laughs> you know? I've, I've debated I've debated people if you debate because I think I mean when we made STV policy on this I was, I was looking forward to doing it it's, uh, I, I love categories and, and <laughs> you know and so we we you know talked to a lot of people including yourself and and tried to get it right and I think we got it right but I think the things like sport is, is, is a basic easy win but they, it, when I debate it with people particularly young people, a lot of young women actually will mm. debate it with me yeah, yeah, yeah. and just not see it and say it doesn't matter. So, you know, have, uh, safety is the easiest thing. I mean, I actually spoke to a, a, a student sports rep at a, one of the Flake Glass universities and I said, we, you know, so what, what is your policy on, on trans rugby players? She was a rugby player herself. Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't, we don't have one, they can just play. Well, are any of them playing? She said, well, no, but it, when that happens, do you realise you know, <laughs> do you have to have someone maimed? This is going to happen. Do you oh, think we, something magical is going to happen and yeah. they're suddenly going to lose half their body weight? Yeah, and it wasn't, <laughs> and it wasn't, it's just like, let's pretend it's not there. I'm really not engaged it's with it. And this is a, you know, a very intelligent person. Yeah, doesn't I know, really get well, it. intelligent. Fact, I know, it, it doesn't always <laughs> coincide with wisdom. But, <laughs> it, but it was, no, it was, it was sort of scary. And I thought, well, what will it take? I mean, my, my hunch is that unfortunately it'll have to take, I mean, it's like the tennis has been on now this weekend, you know, you, it'll have to take, you know, some, some man, man beating Emma Raducanu in the f single final. And then, and then people say, well, it's not fair. You know, they can see it's not fair. Uh, but you won't yes, have any but, female. I mean, yeah, maybe. I um, don't know, because you can already find those cases. You can find them in the Olympics. You can find them in the World Paralympics have just happened. Mm. Um, but it's the profile. It's like, it's like the, the Scotland thing. It's the pro I mean, it, it, those things have already yeah. happened before. Or someone breaking their neck. Yeah, suddenly, suddenly it, it happens. Um, I mean, I, I, this is a, 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 a side issue. I think the, again, when you, I think a lot of these things, the people that make the running, that have the power effectively, because uh, the interest groups and agitators have had the power in this, um, they have the power, but they don't have hegemony. And the you know, public attitudes out in the hinterland, in reality, don't yeah. correspond with these things. And very little uh, account is taken with it. I mean, just on definitions, I I love tabletop uh, analogies when I'm talking about stuff. So it, it just seems to me odd that defining a woman, uh. Uh, what it, how we define a woman, the definition has been changed by on the tabletop quite a small group in the corner. And yet the majority of people in this country, in most countries, are women, and, and they weren't really asked. And mm. it affects them, and they, they, you know, their own definition, their own, I guess, their own identity, you know. It's uh, a I bit mean, presumptuous. Yes, it is, although, you know, a lot of the people, unfortunately, that did that in the corner are women. Um, as you sort of identified mm. earlier when you said it was a woman that was doing this. I mean, often it's women that are most vociferous, mm. cheerleaders for this, and because they are women, it gives them some kind of authority to speak, you know, in the eyes of others for the 51% of the human Population, race. Yeah. But I mean, in my view, we made a big mistake, feminism made a big mistake in making womanhood an identity at all. <laughs> it's just the wrong way to think about it. I mean, I understand how in colloquial ways of speaking, yeah, we mm. say like, oh, how to be a woman. Um, but there is no how to about being a woman. It's something you have no control over whatsoever. No. You either are or, or you, you aren't. aren't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not an identity. It's not a skill you can master. Mm. It's not a, a standard you can attain. All of that normative talk. Um, we should have been, philosophers should have been more careful to distinguish like normative discussion about womanhood from def definitional discussion of womanhood. The two are not the same. And in fact, normative stuff is really just sort of badly expressed about it's really about femininity mm. it's not about mm. womanhood womanhood is a state you're but, an adult human female you're a woman you know that's it you could you i guess you could trace 
you could trace a lot of this back to what you know what I might call proper philosophers, but I don't think Butler's a proper philosopher. I don't think I don't, I don't think so. Say that again. I don't think Butler is a proper philosopher. <laughs> I think you know you, uh, just it's it's it's. Well, she yeah. Apparently, she was giving an interview the other day, and she doesn't think I am either. So well, <laughs> it's uh, reciprocal. We we di we differ. <laughs> yeah. um, the other consequence uh, I want to get into, which it has massive political salience, is the impact of this on children and. Mm. Uh, obviously, I, you know, speak to people all over the country, and a typical, a normal uh, response to me as a politician is someone will say, uh, you know, I've got a, a seven-year-old daughter. I don't want her to go to school and to be told she's not a girl. Yeah. And I agree with that. Yeah. So what, you know, policy terms, it's, it's everywhere, isn't it? Well, how do you, how do you, do you have a rule? You, you literally have to have a rule that this can't be mentioned or can't be taught. What do you do? I don't have an easy answer to what goes on in schools, to be honest, um, because it's uh, unfortunately the stable door is now so wide open yeah. and on the social internet media. is yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah. widely available. Yeah. I don't yeah. think not talking about it will do, mm. unfortunately. But that's what irritates parents. What I'm, what I'm saying is that they, because when, when, you, when, when your five-year-old goes off to school, you, you lose uh, influence over them. Yeah. It's, it's a, that's a big hurdle anyway. But they... Parents feel, I just, I just don't want this. I don't want the seeds to be. Uh, no, I don't. Really. To, to, I mean, to what set. needs to happen um, at least is um, institution needs to work in parallel, and there is, thank God, some movement in the NHS towards sanity now, mm. and there is um, an attempt to get evidence, proper evidence, <laughs> not just cherry picked. Um, anecdotal evidence which mm. seemed to be all that anyone was going on mm. about how to treat children with gender dysphoria mm. and how to react to them and it's not obvious that you should you should affirm them at all in fact it's obvious you shouldn't to me. oh not at all yeah, no, yeah you I, should yeah. so once this body of evidence becomes sort of firmed up it needs to, everyone needs to know about it mm. you know there needs to be no argument about it mm. um and do you schools have need to then for therefore then they can start saying well on the basis of evidence this is the the best way to treat this child who has some confusion. Do you actually have faith that the evidence could be produced in a in a good faith manner and published? Yes. Yeah? Yes, I think it that is one of the advantages of um, there being a methodology, a scientific methodology, mm. an established one. Mm. Um, there's a whole raft of conceptual tools already existing. Um, which were not being applied because mm. this was somehow uh, gender dysphoria was sort of carved out as totally separate and unrelated to any other mental health problem or physical issue and it was given to so-called experts who were t who took charge of it um, and everyone else just thought oh well they know what they're doing they didn't think twice mm. and then when you look at what they were actually doing well what they're doing it's is astonishing is, is, but it's isn't it I don't know if it's rare or it's the only case where uh, you know you could argue what was diagnosed as a mental illness uh, is tr is treated by physical interventions. Yeah, treated literally. by physical interventions that were exper experimental, experimental and for which there yeah. was no um, compelling evidence base and for which there were a lot of worries mm. about the, the 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 medicine that it had all these side effects that were mm. already becoming apparent. You know, mm. like bone health, for instance, osteopor mm. early onset osteoporosis. Mm. Some and all that's going to all that's going to come out, unfortunately. Well, it can't. Yeah. I don't see how it can't come out it was mm. disputed but i mean um lots of gender clinics clinics that have been treating children with gender dysphoria are stopping using puberty blockers in finland and i think in sweden um and so and the uk is now on it through this uh, review nhs yeah, review yeah. by hillary cass so yeah. um that will filter down and i've noticed doctors from other areas coming in and using terms like iatrogenic harm, you know, harm that's caused by the, the medical treatment itself, or, mm. or basically saying, um, using quite bold terms like child abuse. <laughs> yeah, you know? well, some do. I mean, actually, some, on, you know, some activists do, do, I mean, Percy Parker probably would say that. Uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes you just need to say, yeah, yeah. this is really, there is no good way of dressing up what has been happening See? here. I'm really a good fan. I'm a big fan of... Um, an internet meme which people tend to stick at the bottom of various trans activists or celebrities and it says start thinking of an excuse why you agreed to sterilizing children mm. <laughs> That's, yeah people should start thinking about their excuses yeah well it, it is changing i read i think it was last week there was a, a piece in about australian insurance industry 
Right. Uh, refusing to ensure doctors that practice this, so, right? They, you know, and actually, that that, yeah, that might be, a, be a big a liability. Thing. Either way, it's 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 astonishing the uh, the incidence of gender dysphoria in children. So I've got the figures in your book uh, in 2010. I think this is the UK figure uh, r r uh, referred to the NHS 72 in 2010. Ten mm. years later, 2,364. So what's your? I mean, a lot's been on talked about this. What's your? What's your view on, on, the, on the cause of that massive explosion of...? Well, partly gender dysphoria is very, in practice, has been very ill-defined, very loosely defined. I mean, really, that would include a child who turns up um, to their teacher and says, oh, um, you know, I think I'm a boy, mm. <laughs> um, as opposed to someone who's profoundly distressed by their own body. Mm. Um, mm. And... If you read Hannah Barnes's book, Time to Think, which gives you an overview of the evolution, if you want to call it that, of the Tavistock Gender Identity Service, and it really is a staggering read, the early cohort um, were severely distressed. They were severely, they had multiple problems. So what you're saying, you're not comparing like with like on these... On um, these not classes. anymore, no, yeah, because yeah. back then, you know, there was, I think there's, there's some staggering statistic in that book about how the likelihood of having a parent on the child sex offender register for this cohort is much higher. Mm. You know, there's, there's, there's really all, be all there's things that psych psychologists must be like mm. thinking, should have been thinking, yeah. there, are, there is stuff going on and there's obviously a high proportion of autism and then there's also a high proportion of same-sex attracted mm. or proto-same-sex attracted people in this cohort. And the Tavistock themselves, would, people were joking there, you know, there aren't going to be any gay people left if we carry on. Well, that's the so, LGB Alliance uh, concern, isn't it? Of, yeah. Of, of raising a, a generation of uh, gay and lesbian but people. What, but what happened, I mean, yeah, so there's all these concerns and there's still concerns, but, um, but then it, that was in 2010, but then over that 10 years, smartphones happened, the internet happened, YouTube influencers happened, um, Tumblr happened mm. and Stonewall in 2015 um, following other organisations like Gendered Intelligence who already had um, quite a lot of influence on youth culture as it were mm. um, all got on board with this trans train idea mm. and mm. it became cool mm. and so now you c it is social contagion mm. a large, and a large mm. amount of it is social contagion mm. and teachers will say oh there's when there's friends. no trans-identified ch yeah. children in this one classroom, and then there, then there's one, and then there's three, and then there's friends. seven, you all, know? Yeah, yeah. and then half of them are. I can see that. I think the, I mean, what I would say, if you step back from the whole thing and you say, well, I think it's partly the cause of, of, of what, particularly what sort of Catholic theorists like Patrick Deneen talk about, which is the, the, the uh, current absence or the removal of, of, of boundaries and rootedness and you know people, it's funny I mentioned rootedness the other day at a party and someone says that's a terrible idea you know you must be far right you must be something <laughs> oh well no just you're talking about community really you're talking about right. you know just knowing the, the point that Deneen would make um, mm -hmm. is that you know a long time ago someone would would know that they were working class from the northeast a Newcastle United fan Roman Catholic and a lot of other things and so they, their sense of their mm. identity was there were back, very, very strong boundaries. They knew, in a, to put it crudely, they knew who they were. And now the, the, a lot of the boundaries have been removed and we don't really know who we are. And, it's, and we're saying kid, to kids, oh, you decide. You, it's up to you. you know? and, and the thinking is that if you, if you apply some reasonable boundaries, like, like religion. I mean, I'm, I'm not a religious believer myself, but religion used to have the... the per, one of the purposes was to, 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 to provide a boundary that you can kick against later. And mm. it was very healthy for people to say, oh, like, Actually, I'm deciding in my teens I'm not that. But there is a sense, I don't know if you agree, there is a sense that, that very, very young people are just, are just not given the boundaries they were. So they don't know they're a boy or a girl. It really I is I don't up know to them. about that, to be honest. I mean, I, it's a separate, I'm not, mm. I'd have to agree with you on two points, which is one, that they don't have the boundaries they used to and that that was feeding into this phenomenon. And I agree with you, obviously, parenting styles have changed mm. obviously they have mm. but what my impression is more um well firstly i'm aware for instance that um amongst my lesbian friends of my generation lots and lots of them ident identified as boys you know it's not it's not a new thing mm. what's new is our response to it mm. so it's the adult response to it that mm. i find is 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 producing the phenomenon mm. partly at least partly contributing to it because when my friend, um, 
Heidi used to call herself George for three years and really, really wanted to be a boy, you know. Mm. Um, I think her mum did call her George for three years, but no, but nothing around her confirmed her in this belief and it passed. Whereas now, yeah, I'm I, I'm always, you know, I, it's more about question about why are the adults so keen? You know, what's going on with the adults? Mm. <laughs> and that might also be some Oh, that's true. of liberalism, yeah, but no, you know, it's yeah, no, kind no, of like status attached just, to it. Yeah, no, oh, think, I'm so cool and I'm so no, that's liberal. Just, I, again, another very crude look at it is just runaway liberalism. It's, it's where you have a situation where liberalism it gives you a whole series of rights, but it's, 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 it gives you what you want, basically. To deny me what I want is some sort of breach, you know, and I, I can have what I want, and that includes to define these things. Mm. Um, I want to talk about the, the vehemence in this debate, because it sort of flippantly the interesting thing about the work you do in the book is, which is just, which is normal categories, normal analytical <coughs> philosophy. Uh, and I would say that actually so, a few years ago, I think some, someone may have, you might have failed the first year knowledge and reality paper, or it was certainly you'd rather argue hard just saying, please myself on an inner feeling, I can do what I like. And, but mm. anyway, the heat and vehemence in this, Mm. debate is astonishing and obviously you, you're you're handing out at Sussex and that you know national news and flippantly you might say well you know philosophers you might have uh, you know an essentialist on something or you know a dualist might disagree with materialist or whatever and they're they're perfectly fine with it but in this mm. case uh, you're making a case and suddenly it's it's that's yeah. appalling why, why, I think we know why that is, but why, why do you think that is? Why is there so much heat? Um, I'm not sure I, I know for sure. I mean, I think there's definitely one element is, um, it possibly even comes from that goodwill that you were talking about earlier, or slightly less charitably from the pity that I was talking about. Because I'm afraid to say, I think that there is a kind of attitude, if we're talking about um, transsexuals, I think people, you know, people sort of, it's easier for people to think of a transsexual male as a woman, because if they don't think of her as a woman, then they've got to think of her as a castrated male. And that's really... So it's more, more it's economical. Too it's confusing more, and yeah, more, brings out too many feelings of disturbance. So it's just sort of like, and they also, there's this thing which happens all the time, particularly on the left, of worrying what other people are going to think. No, I'm all right, but what about these rabid... Mm. Um, you know, weeks who are going yeah, to going like to take it too far. Yeah. yeah so yeah, there's always yeah. a worry about danger and harm, not from yourself. I mean, maybe you're projecting onto others, but you know, but from this other un unwashed mass mm. of people who are going to like attack her as soon as we say she's not a woman. So we've got to keep maintaining this fiction. So they get there's, there's definitely some of that going on. That like if if you say that's a man, obviously I don't go up to people and say you're a man, but if you say in categorical, you know, general categorical terms trans women are men, <laughs> um, you'll be raining down all sorts of terrible harm on them. So you've ru I, so they feel I, I, then that they're like uh, justice fighters. They've yeah, got to shut me up and yeah, it's a I, matter I, of, con of I, urgency. I think the reason is, that my take on it is that I think there's, there's a lot more at stake for them. I mean, I think they, what you're doing is doing proper work and then just sort of popping their balloon or the emperor's new clothes. And you, do it, you can do it quite economically. And if you, if you, mm. if you deny it, you know, I, I mean, you know, the, the, the phrase that we're encouraged to say in you know, a trans woman or women, I don't think they are. I think they're trans women. If you, if you didn't need the word, if they were trans women, you wouldn't need the prefix trans yeah. anyway. So it just, you know, I think there's a lot, a lot at stake for them in that you, you're able to just, they, they've, they've created a, a narrative and a meaning in their lives. And what they, this, is, this does explain the, the, the hostility. They're desperately upset with people that say, I just don't agree with you. And that's oh, yeah. why there isn't, there isn't tolerance about it. But then, I mean, it. you know, lots of, there's lots of versions of that story. Like, there's lots of, you know, evangelical Christians that are constantly being mocked, but they're not sort of yeah. rageful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people say, well, you're, you know, you believe in a fantasy no or the rest yeah, of it, yeah, but yeah. people don't, they get rageful. Yeah. Another element, I'm afraid, and it's not necessarily, so we've always got to distinguish between um, different kinds of, trans people, as it were, to people who are attracted to trans identity for different reasons. And there is, um, especially amongst trans women, but not all of them by any means, but there are some, you know, raging narcissists. There are mm. some absolutely uh, off the scale. I've, I've noticed that. Unstable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, why wouldn't it be unstable? It's a category you're telling people anyone can identify into yeah. for any reason. You will yeah. get total protection. 
you know, you, if yeah. you go to jail, you can choose your prison. Yeah. Yeah. Once you come out of jail, your, your red records are expunged. And we're surprised that a bunch of unstable, raging but narcissists that, join this But group. that's also, no, but that is, that, just to go back to what we were saying before, you know, a few minutes ago, that also very much plays into the sort of runaway liberalism thing, because, you know, some societies in the world are much more communitarian. It's not about you, it's not about me, it's, mm -hmm. the, it's the I, we balance. Mm -hmm. In the West, the I, we balance, the me, us balance is, I think, are completely out of whack. And mm. so if you, if you have an ideology or a narrative that's all about me, hey, it's great, you know, it's all about me. <laughs> and that, that partly explains it. I think um, in any case, the vehemence is there. And, and obviously, I, I, if, you, if you can, I'd like to say a few words about what happened at, at Oxford, because the, again, it goes to the heart of the university mm. and it made, made national news mm. again. And um, I prefix this by... by talking about the university in general, I think, which is, which is uh, in trouble in a sense. John Gray wrote this, see what you think of this. It is hard to see why any sensible person would enroll in a humanities degree at the present time. They also learn that disagreement in ethics and politics is illegitimate. Basically, what he's, I mean, he's making, I mean, he's in a, in a, I love John Gray, and, a, but a, and he's making a point in a, a typical John Gray way, but but it, there's a lot at stake here. If you can't, I mean, if you yeah. can't, for so start, if you can't write that book and do normal work, you can't do philosophy in this area. Yeah, I mean, I, I love John Gray too, um, polemically. I enjoy reading him, but, I, and I'm, but I'm wary of doing a John Gray there because I am conscious that, as you are, in, there are philosophy departments still going where absolutely almost anything is up for grabs, <laughs> almost anything. And it'd be crazy to think that just because you couldn't discuss this one thing, that there was nothing of value going on there. Oh, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. So there's no, lots he, of he's, do, he's doing what he does. Great, yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. I'm just making it clear. Yeah. I mean, everything yeah. I say is scrutinised, and um, I, I, I think there's still a lot of value in the humanities. But what is certainly true is that um, too many departments or academics have, have decided that they're philosophers. You know, it's just a term that you can add to to the to the things you're interested in your your research specialties or your areas of interest, mm. and you can just say philosophy, or you can specify epistemology, or um, <clears throat> or some kind of post structuralism, whatever it is, and you can have had no formal training in it really, mm. and you can understand practically nothing about it. You've mm. read a few um, introductory books and barely understood those. You know, and and what I found quite a lot teaching when I was teaching philosophy students who were also doing other subjects like English, um, that they would come in and say, oh, my English tutor said that they're, you know, all truth is relative. On what grounds? And they'd yeah. say, oh, well, you know, it's raining, it's, it's raining can be true here and false mm. there. Mm. And that's not bloody no, relativism. It's just awful. You know, so it's, it's, there's laziness going on a lot of humanities yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in, in an attempt to look deep because they got bored with doing what they should what I think is absolutely fascinating, which is analysing literary texts, you mm. know, endlessly rich literary texts, but people have got bored with that and they want something a bit more kind of groovy and mm. sexy for themselves and they are hollowing out the, the philosophical method and discipline. But a trained philosopher, that's the irritating thing for a trained philosopher, is they would see, you'd see the flaws, you know, it just doesn't follow what they're seeing and you have to yeah. then to... to um, debate them, you have to educate them at the same time. Yeah, exactly. A complete pain. Quite often they yeah. turn up to my talks, because I talks would be on literature quite often, or fiction, and, mm. and they just sit there with this sort of sneering scowl on their face, and then their question would be like, why are you doing this at all? This isn't interesting. Mm. <laughs> it's like, well, it's interesting to me, mate, you know, I mean, yeah. that's not really a question that even, mm. in philosophy, we, we don't ask that sort of question, we ask targeted, specific yeah, but in, uh, but objections. Sense, uh, but, but philosophy, I mean, there's a sense where philosophy, in a sense, it does, some philosophers don't, don't care. Do they? I mean, what, what, what someone says, you know, this is why you talked earlier about non-engagement with non-philosophy. Mm. You know, some, the, the joke, what was it, the, 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 one of the jokes, you know, when 1950s Oxford philosophy was very insular, and uh, I think a, a, tutor, a, a philosophy tutor from Glasgow came down to speak, and they're having a, uh, a meal afterwards, and the, the Glasgow philosopher said, I hope you don't think bad of us in, in Glasgow. I said, no, no, we don't think of you at all. <laughs> and that's the that's the sort of you know you can, yeah it is it's very funny yeah. but, but you know there is I suppose you could do that but Oxford I mean how what was it because how it was reported I mean it's on the front page of a few it few was, was, on the front page was it that big a deal or was could or would you and do you think Oxford did you 
Well, I was surprised, obviously, to see myself on the front cover of two newspapers. But mm. um, I think... I just went... It, I mean, also, because I watched it, and mm. you were pretty well received in science. Yeah, I was. I didn't know how it was going to be received. Um, that's, I'd done one at Cambridge not that long beforehand, and that was very tense and mm. unpleasant experience, basically, and a big mm. protest outside, and also lots of hostility in the chamber. Um, and I was expecting that again, um, and then there was a cheer as I went in. Yeah, I didn't see it Sorry, at all. I, didn't, I, yeah. <laughs> I heard the noise outside. And actually, when the protester glued uh, her, herself, yeah. um, I don't know what her pronouns are, uh, to the floor, um, they would, there was a, quite a lot of hostility towards her. I mean, they cut it out of the actual filming, but there was mm. a lot of like, get her off, get her off. Yeah, you know, that yeah, sort yeah. of thing. No, so you, do you, are you optimistic about that as a time tide turning a bit on well, that? Well, I like, yes. Because people in the are sense paying that, for an but it was, mo it was interesting. It's mostly male audience. And I mm. think actually the pushback is going to come from men. And mm. uh, like I said, a lot of women are invested in this. And men seem to be able, um, for whatever reasons, I don't you know, you want to analyse those, but to, to say this is bollocks. Mm. <laughs> and actually I'm all for it, you know, just... Just say it because well, we I need to get rid of this. this no, is I've, really I've debated, I debated it recently with someone and they, they said I shouldn't be really having a view because I was a man. But anyway, no, I, no, no, I think no, that's no, complete nonsense. Having a view on this. No, I think you can. Well, no, but it's to, it, well, I, I'm married, I have a sister, I, you know, I have a goddaughter. I, uh, we've, everyone yeah. everyone is, is linked in it. Um, I, I had a similar experience, not, not, it wasn't quite the scale of yours, but it was a bizarre experience at York in September last year. I went to speak about, to give a, a talk about trade policy and tariffs, you know, mm -hmm. quite technical talk. Uh, and the LGBT York group had, uh, had found out that I was speaking <laughs> and that I was a transphobe and a racist apparently because I want lower immigration. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, a problem. So they tried to get the... And to, to York's credit, they made sure that the talk went ahead. It did and you could hear people shouting outside. Right. But I had to get you know someone to stop people throwing milkshakes at me. And nothing happened right. really. I wasn't particularly... But it was weird. I, but I wrote to the VC after that because what, I, what was unfair about it was that I was made to agree to a 14,000, I didn't read it all, but a 14,000 word pledge of what I would say, and I wouldn't say any this, and I wouldn't say oh, any that, right. you know, so in order to, you know, this is their code to, to turn maybe up. call that a risk assessment or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, so, and I agreed to that, and, and all, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, if criticizing a bilateral trade agreement with Japan was transferred, <laughs> I, I have no idea, but it, anyway, I, I was, so I wasn't going to even talk about those things, yeah. but but they made me agree with that. And then I wrote to the VC and said, what you, but what you allowed the LGBT group to do, the union do, and they put it on the union, mm. was, was defame totally me. Totally defame you. And, yeah. and I said I wanted them in the room because if they're in the room, I could have explained the history of the SDP and, and the, you know, the uh, well, Sexual Offences Act. Room. No, but they don't want to be in the room, but they, they, would, have been, they would have learned something about uh, they wouldn't, what though. Roy Jenkins they did. They really or, would. They weren't prepared They would have be. been listening. No, no. And the whole point is not to listen. Nothing about this is, is about education. No, no. <laughs> it's about posturing on the internet to their pals. Mm. And also, and sometimes it's about avoiding criticism from their pals. I mean, in your case, I think they really had to go out of their way to find that you were coming and but there was you know, double standards the vc was scared oh no i can he, see he that he treated me differently yeah yeah, to yeah i can see that i mean yeah. i don't disagree with you yeah. um but in my case it's almost like when i arrive they're like oh we've got to do something you know if we don't do something we're in trouble mm. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> there's a sort of extra pressure but yeah i mean it's it, universities you shouldn't you shouldn't be having to sign that thing and it's ridiculous. I actually have never signed one of those things. They never, no one's ever asked me. Even. But sometimes, if you don't, then they say you're not. I mean, they had three yeah. members of staff watching me. It was. It was. It was. Well, it'll be interesting ridiculous. to see what the um, the new, you know, what happens in the higher education bill is properly yeah. in place because I don't mm. know, you know, if, if it will just take one speaker to go to Ofsted. Uh, sorry, what they called Office for Students. Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't know what where they stand on that, but you know. There will be precedent set for universities and practice will spread as it always does quite quickly so mm, mm. it'll be interesting to see how they handle that sort of thing let's hope let's hope um you have a final chapter in the book about solutions uh and less stereotypical view i think i agree with that certainly uh, less dilution because you talk about the dilution of, of definitions don't you? there are so many we, we we don't know what we're talking about yeah of course, um, half of issue. this is about people at cross purposes. I mean, one of the one of the questions I got at Oxford, I thought was 
pretty telling because it was a woman that clearly had only ever heard about me secondhand and heard about this debate secondhand mm. and then had listened to us discussing it mm. and said, why are you so controversial? <laughs> I don't, you know, all... I, I don't, I didn't know much about this beforehand and now I'm really struggling to see why. Yeah, what the problem is, so, yeah. And it's because yeah. people don't engage the arguments directly, they yeah. just hear. Yeah. Um, very confused concepts being used and a lot of uh, hyperbole thrown in. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately that's the level of social media and, and yeah. contagion. Yeah. Uh, you also say more intersectionality, which I, on, certainly on class I totally <laughs> agree with you. Um, and the final one is more, more data, less theory, more data. That's happening now. I mean, it's maybe not happening as fast as it should. And I think there's still some real structural impediments in academia because you like you can't do research on women or lesbians mm. um, without making it a self-identified category. But mm. for instance, um, uh, data um, collecting agencies seem to be more aware that they have to look for sex as well as mm. whatever else they want to add. Well, or you can't know anything. That's the problem. Or you can't know anything. Or you can't You're know anything. Finding, yeah, I mean, yeah. Having said that, I went yeah. to my doctor's website the other day and it was like sex, male, female, other. Mm. <laughs> it's like, mm. okay. It's everywhere. <laughs> well, listen, Kathleen, it's been wonderful finally to speak to you. And um, obviously, if you haven't got the book, I'd urge everyone to read it. And uh, you've, yeah. you've um, given us all a, a service by writing it. Thank you oh, very thank much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.